All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, Andrew Farr here, Managing Editor of Water Finance and Management. And uh, I hope everybody is staying safe and staying healthy out there. I have three great guests uh, that I'm talking with a little bit today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about how things stand right now in the water sector uh, as we are, continue to be in the midst of this uh, pandemic. Um, obviously, we've seen some of the projections coming out uh, the last couple of weeks from, uh, you know, AWWA and AMWA and NACWA, we're seeing some of the, the um, projections as far as revenue loss uh, on the drinking water side, as well as the, the clean water side. Um, so we're going to, we're going to get into a little bit of that. So uh, let me just go ahead and introduce uh, my guest. Of course, we have uh, George Hawkins, uh, founder of Moonshot Missions, and of course, uh, former uh, CEO and general manager at DC Water. Uh, we have Andy Kraken, who is a uh, managing director at Moonshot Missions and uh, former CEO of uh, Camden County Municipal Utilities Authority in New Jersey. And uh, of course, finally, we have our uh, longtime contributor, uh, Greg Baird, uh, president of the Water Finance Research Foundation. So, gentlemen, thanks very much for taking some time today. Uh, George, I'm going to I'm going to come to you first. Uh, as I understand it, you are um part of a committee uh, in DC that's uh, working on uh, ways to sort of re reopen things, open up the economy. Can you give us a little bit of uh, insight on that and some of the discussions that are going on and, and some of the challenges? Sure, um, and great to be with uh, this group of friends and colleagues. Um, I, I learn as much from these conversations as anything I offer, so I'm glad to be here with you today. Um, I was uh, honored by Mayor Bowser to be selected to be on the Committee for Reopening DC, which is not when, that will be a medical question, it's how. So when the decision is made to reopen the city, which is obviously not going to happen all at once, what are the steps that need to be taken to, to do so safely and properly? Um, and I'm on the infrastructure and transportation subcommittee. Um, some of the topics, and I don't want to go into too much length because uh, it's such a rich question, but some of the topics we're facing on this panel are the same that water utilities are looking at. And one of the principal questions is, we want to have a city that's equitable. And during this pandemic, a lot of steps have been taken to help the lowest income of our customers of our in our uh, customer base for water utilities be able to continue with water service, which is, of course, is ne always necessary for public health, but particularly necessary when you need to wash your hands while singing happy birthday two times over and all the rest. Um, and not having cutoffs, actually putting what I call cut-ons, which is people who are previously cut off being put back on service, waiving late fees, offering all sorts of payment terms. All of those are the right steps to do for people who need water. And this and uh, risk from this uh, from this coronavirus could last quite long into the future. And that's important and that's equitable. On the other side, we know, as you just mentioned, that revenue is dropping. And how do you operate an ongoing enterprise that has all the expenses to deliver the service if your revenue drops? And water is not the only utility that's facing that question. It's very similar on electric. It's very similar on gas. There's just a lot of core utilities for a city that has this conundrum that, that, that we face. The second is an interesting category of what are the kinds of things we can do now that are hard to do in almost any other circumstance because of this moment. This moment has all sorts of tragedy and horrific consequences, but it also has opened up opportunities. And so we're trying to look at, while there's little traffic, while the city's very quiet, are there things that we could contemplate in redesigning the city that would be much harder to do at the level of full operations? And then third, as you do ramp up, how can you ramp up and what are the strategies that can yield permanent improvements? And um, what are the steps you take now so that the city is permanently in a different place? And I think those are all the kinds of things that we're thinking about in the water utility world very directly. There's no easy answers, I have to say. It's been tough going already. Imagine trying to open up Metro, which is sort of the lifeblood of the city, but everyone's afraid to get into a Metro card unless they're six feet away from someone else. And that if Metro cars are packed. My 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 employees used to call it riding the sardine can in the morning because of how packed it was. And that's a day gone by. So how are we going to get people in and out of the city with social distancing and traffic and all the rest? It's some pretty fascinating questions. Yeah. 
And Andy, uh, I'll just bring you in into this. Uh, you know, what are some of your your thoughts uh, about uh, and you know bringing this to to water and wastewater utilities uh, specifically? What are from what you've heard as a you know and as a former uh, head of a utility? What do you what do you think is kind of the most concerning part of where we're at right now? Well, I think the most positive thing that I'm that I'm seeing and hearing is that in spite of this, you know. Uh, you know, national, of course, worldwide tragedy, water utilities across the country and across the world are continuing to provide safe drinking water and protect the waterways, even though this is, you know, has been such a prolonged tragedy and, and challenge, you know, in, in the case of like a hurricane or, you know, a tornado it, it, or earthquake, it, it lasts for a period of time and then you know, things go back to normal. This has been, you know, a, a prolonged period of time where, where utilities have to run short staff. So, and, and also, they need to protect their staff while while also you know optimizing performance. So I think the water utilities across the country have done a tremendous job with that. Uh, what they're going to have to face and pivot toward, and they're already starting to think about it, is what to do next. I mean, as George just mentioned, there are there are two main problems. One that a lot of people who are or who already were income challenged or are now income challenged are going to have the difficulty paying their water bill, and yet they they need that service. And then second, uh, the utilities themselves are going to face you know, revenue shortfalls uh, for at least you know an extended period of time and perhaps permanently. And so, what the water utilities are going to have to face is how do they you know close that that revenue shortfall uh, while still providing you know optimal service and also make sure that that more vulnerable communities and and more vulnerable households aren't adversely impacted. Yeah. And uh, Greg, what are what are some of your initial thoughts on on the financial end of all of this? Well, it, it's it's kind of interesting and in highlighting what uh, has been discussed already. Um, from the financial side, uh, when COVID nineteen hit, we were worried about the absenteeism of the essential staff and being able to have it. When we start understanding that this isn't a short-term issue, that by the time a vaccination is completed and you have a global vaccination program, that's where you actually reduce it just because we learned how interconnected we are uh, as a, a global society. So the threat of, of different issues aren't going to go away. So we have to protect ourselves. But as we start reopening, it's not absenteeism, but now we have the revenue loss, we have the budget cuts, so now we're down to essential staff. And if anything happens to them, we're still kind of back into that absentee equation just because of the money. Um, the, the other interesting thing is when, when I was a CFO for a water utility, uh, you know, uh, during the Great Recession, um, we still had, you know, it wasn't to this degree, we still had unemployment, we still had, uh, you know, the fact that cutting off uh, someone from the water to try to get them to pay the legal right that we had um, was still creating a public health issue. But it was really little Johnny has to go to his neighbor's house to take a bath to go to school. So the school doesn't call me as a CFO. But but now we, we're realizing the value of water on a pandemic issue and washing the hands. And, and that is a critical piece. So I think we're now understanding that it's it's a public good and that to a water utility, there was always a cost for staffing and cutting off and hanging the hangers and, and having all those calls and, and, and payment plans be put in place. There was a cost to that. So now we have to find that new balance of going forward, of maintaining uh, resilience, financial resilience with affordability providing the resources for people to be able to pay because water is not free, but we have to almost consider it as a public health issue as a component of our cost structure and, and deal with that instead of feeling like we're doing a straight out subsidy or a handout. And that way I think people can pay something uh, for, to contribute to that value but maybe the the uh, the scale on the economic disadvantage uh, comes into play more as a policy issue. Yeah, and and really, you know, talking about things like resiliency and um, you know how we're going to address emergency planning in the future. Um, you know, those are 
Um, some things that you've written about uh, recently, uh, Greg and um, George and Andy, you guys obviously laid out some, some issues uh, in, in your recent article um, with us, but why don't we get into a little bit of that, uh, George, in, in talking about some of these issues, what, what could be some of the lasting impacts uh, to the industry uh, because of this? I mean, you guys discussed in the article, you know, some permanent changes that might need to be made or, like I said, lasting impacts. What do, what do you think some of those might be? Um, my <clears throat> and I want to second what both Andy and Greg said. <clears throat> what I feel we've gone through phases, <clears throat> and we've sort of uh, Andy and I have written three articles. The most recent one is the one that you've published. The first one is an emergency response, and the first few weeks of this, it did feel like a hurricane. This huge event had happened. We were all scrambling. How do we change our staffing levels? What are we going to do? Do we have our chemicals? And that was our first article. The second one was now this is going into several weeks to a month or longer. It's no longer an emergency response. How do we do governance? How are we going to procure? How are we going to have board meetings? What, what are all the other ancillary steps? And how do you take them when you are working remotely? The third category is now we're into the real longer term and we're feeling the financial consequence. One part of it is on the residential side, but a huge part is on the commercial side. It is hitting, I was just on a, a call earlier today with several utilities that, that are only suburban and they've actually seen revenues stay stable or go up because everybody's home. But for the big urban systems where you rely on so much of your commuters coming in every day and filling up the office buildings and going to restaurants and all the rest, those numbers have dropped through the floor. And so we have a permanent question of an economic picture that's changed. Uh, the, the, the silver lining to the cloud, and that is a very dark cloud, I don't mean to suggest anyone would have sought this to happen, is that uh, a crisis like this is the motherhood of invention. Um, and we know, uh, uh, and I'll brag on Andy uh, for a minute, he was facing a financial and operational crisis in Camden 22 years ago. And with his team implemented over two years, a series of projects that were able to dramatically cut costs and improve performance that then continued over the following 20. And if you look at his record at Camden County, they improved every indice of performance and reduced rates. Listen to this one, folks. Reduced rates in real terms by 40%. That was because of a whole series of steps that can be taken that are existing costs. So the way we generate revenue in the future world is probably not going to be raising rates. What mayor is going to want us to raise rates when a lot of their population is unemployed and a larger percentage is in low income? It's finding revenue that's already in your balance sheet by being smart about how you implement practices that can reduce operating costs. If you have a lot of non-revenue water, which is water you pump and treat and spend money on for chemicals and, and it's dripping into the ground, that's money out of your wallet already. And if you reduce that number, you actually have new revenue, but it's revenue you already have. And uh, we think that there's a whole range of these steps that a lot of utilities may not have had the impetus to implement when things are okay. But when the crisis hits, I don't. I think they're going to become essential for survival. We're going to need to do these projects, and the possibility is, in fact, to see a transformation over the next year or two that's dramatic. And what I was saying for the city is, can we drive carrying costs to be permanently lower, no matter what the economic circumstances are? Then you have a mayor who can go to a low-income customer and say, "I can offer you a lower rate because my cost of doing the service is less," which is just what. At which Andy did it in Camden. And uh, I think that's what the prospect before us. It's going to be a lot of hard work and sweat equity to get there, but I think the prospect sits before us. So, so with that being said, what are, what are some of the ways that we think that, you know, utilities could go about, uh, you know, cutting some costs and making things more efficient? I mean, Andy, Andy I'll come over to you to, to bring you into this, but I mean, you know, technology, is that going to play a, a big role in this? Obviously, George mentioned, uh, you know, non-revenue water. I mean, you've seen a lot of technology come into the market in recent years, you know, aimed at, at reducing non-revenue water. Well, I think the good news is, is that um, there are a lot of operational efficiencies and, and, and cost-cutting measures and revenue enhancement measures that have already been, you know, uh, adopted by the leading utilities in, in the sector. And so the thing is, is, is the key is to, is to try to promote dissemination of best practices. So as George said, you know, um, a public sector entity isn't always incentivized to be 
on the cutting edge. Sometimes there's a lot, there are disincentives. But now with this revenue shortfall, um, it is really going to be, be incumbent upon utilities to try to be as efficient as possible to try to take the private sector model of efficiency uh, for profit's sake and harness that instead to the public good to cut costs and be able to hold rates or, or minimize rate increases. So um, the public sector is going to have to think in the same way the private sector does, but with the public good in mind, whereas the private sector you know, often thinks about you know, maximizing profit. Um, you know, I think, think too, that uh, I do hope that the federal government will assist with regard to low-income households, because what, you know, even before, prior to the pandemic, um, there were people who could just not could not pay their bill, um, hence shutoffs. But you know, water really, you know, it can break up a home if you don't have wa- water service. Then you know, people can lose lose their children. The children can be repossessed. They can lose their home to tax sale. And so that really isn't isn't right. And I'm hoping that like that the, the, the federal government will come up with an analog to lie for heating and provide assistance low income households. That will h- help the utilities get over this partial hump. Because some of the revenue losses due to from you know, low income residences, but and, and then some of it, of course, will come from the commercial that are going out of business or using less water. And so, if the if the federal government can assist low income households, that'll free the hands of the utilities to implement improvements, you know, improve infrastructure, et cetera, without having to to worry about making it unaffordable for uh, low income households. And then, lastly, you know, the, the the utilities then again do have to practice their own. Uh, you know, optimization performance, things like energy, energy consumption reductions, green energy, uh, re- you know, reduction of maintenance costs, having more preventative maintenance versus reactive maintenance, those sorts of things. And also, I mean, be- because of the, the staffing challenges that we see now and also with, with baby boomers retiring over the next three to five years, you know, utilities are going to have to be more resilient with respect to staffing, too. And so cross training and automation is probably needed in order to make sure that utilities are less vulnerable the loss of staff, whether it be through the like someone like this pandemic or just through you know, attrition through retirement. Yeah, Greg, uh, any any thoughts on on some of those things that uh, George and Andy just mentioned? Anything on uh, you know best best ways that utilities can look at at cost cutting? Yeah, I, I I think we can't do the knee jerk reaction of just cutting city budgets and utility budgets you know across the board and think that's going to offer any efficiency. There has to be a point of being able to say, what technology do we need to invest in? If you're taking a pump station project and it's now going to get delayed, the reason why you needed to do those repair and replacement doesn't go away. Your risk has now increased. So what remote censoring can you put in place to be able to mitigate that risk? Likewise, um, you know, just like we've had to adopt uh, video conferencing as a technology, as a, as a society, we need to do that same thing a little bit more robustly, I think, in monitoring our underground assets and our above ground assets. And we have those data analytics. We have sensor technology. We have those different things. And I think that investment needs to be made or lessons learned from the Great uh, Recession. We cut our maintenance staff. And next thing you know, our affordability went you know, sideways because all of a sudden we had premature failure of our assets and we actually increased the cost of what we needed to do. And we don't want that type of uh, repeat. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, one, one thing that comes to mind for me, and I think Greg, we've, we've talked a little bit about this. I, if, if anything, I think this whole situation almost highlights uh, how many challenges, you know, utilities face on a regular basis. I think, um, you know, we talked about on uh, the 2019 AWWA State of the Industry Report, I think emergency preparedness was what, nine? Number nine. <laughs> yeah. And and I don't think that's necessarily, you know, that's not to suggest that utilities weren't putting emphasis on emergency planning, but it's just simply that there's a range of, of challenges and it just kind of came out at number nine. Um, so it just, it, it highlights how many challenges there are regularly. Um, what, let's, uh, bring this to some, some positive news. What, what do you guys think is, uh, you know, any positives that are going to come out of this or anything that you're, you're hearing right now? Um, obviously it's, it's good news that, uh, um, you know, service, uh, is, is continuing and the water is safe to drink. Uh, George, any thoughts on that? Um, Andrew, I, I love the question because my sense is that at a time of crisis like this, one of the things we learn is what's possible. 
uh, utilities are now learning that they can run their systems with lower staffing and using some of these techniques, which might have been true before, but now they've had to do it and look what's possible. And um, I, I think that the financial challenges that are going to come will cause a most utilities to question assumptions they may not have questioned before. And it's not because they aren't good people, they aren't smart. It's just when something like this comes along, it is going to, I think we'll be in a wholly different place. And um, I'm very excited about that prospect, that what this will do is jog some of the assumptions. It's been very standard to sort of go along with the current. But as Greg and, and Andy said, the number of interventions, I hate to use that word, but the number of steps that can be taken in a utility that improve performance and reduce costs. One of the things that Andy did, this is very operational. He had more primary treatment tra tanks than he needed because the Camden area had had been smaller than its industrial heyday. But one of the steps he took was to bring some of those primary tanks online that weren't necessarily needed for the flow alone. And by doing so, reduced chemical costs, reduced power costs, reduced costs associated with biosolids. And that was a project that was sitting there ready to go. It was the financial challenge that, that the Camden County Municipal Utility Authority and the challenge that Andy was facing of how could we operate this that caused that finally to be implemented. And I believe there are dozens of those in most utilities. And it's, and it's not because people aren't great, smart, and capable. There is so many issues on the priority list. That one has now jumped to the top. And now this need is going to drive a lot of activities that have always sort of been there. And now they're going to come to the forefront. And my guess is five years from now, we end up with a utility marketplace that looks a lot different and has got core benefits. Greg, I hope you're, I, I fear that, they, that the quick step would be just cut things and then we will see it again. I'll tell a little story. In, in, the, in, in the Great Recession, there was money set aside that was, was designed to build, rebuild the electric grid and rebuild it with new technology. That was very forward thinking because the 15 years since, there's been this incredible in, in, increase in green energy. That would have been impossible had those technical steps not been in, put in place for the grid in a time of crisis. And my big question now is what are the steps we put in place now that actually set us in a path for the next 10, 15 years that completely change the economics of the system? And I'm excited about that. I, I agree with everything that George said. And I also say that the, the good news is, is that while, while we're, we're always glad to see new technologies and new, you know, new innovative technologies, it isn't as though we need to rely on undiscovered technologies in order to improve performance and reduce costs right now. There are a number of, George, as George was saying, a number of practices that are being implemented by the best utilities in, in the country and in the nation that just need to trickle down. We need to accelerate the dissemination of, of best practices across the sector so that others can, can uh, benefit from, from these already known, already implemented and proven technologies and practices. Uh, and the good news is that in the public sector, people are willing to share. Uh, it's just that we're also siloed, you know, especially um, one of the things that the EPA, they did a study on on peer-to-peer -peer work and, and they indicated that one of the biggest detriments to underserved communities is their lack of being networked, being, you know, being non-networked, not going to conferences, not being plugged in and not hearing what the best utilities are doing. So if New York does something innovative, Chicago and LA know about it pretty quickly and can adapt it or replicate it, but smaller towns who aren't, you know, they're not hearing about it. And these, the, the, the trickle down and dissemination of information is so much slower for the non-network utilities, which are the majority of the utilities. So I think the, the key for the sector is to be almost like uh, bees that pollinate flowers more effectively and uh, the flowers of knowledge and, and best practices. Uh, to, I think that will benefit the sector tremendously. And I agree with George, necessity will, will drive that. Yeah. Greg, positive uh, benefits to come out of this perhaps? Yeah, uh, well, I, I wanna make a plug for their, uh, their article that uh, you posted yesterday. Uh, it highlighted uh, resilience and workforce and affordability and kind of uh, used that as a framework to be, to be able to lay things out. And, and I, I think each of those things are, are uh, interconnected and, and very, my, my goal would be that the cost of innovation is reduced so it's affordable to more technologies. The 50,000, 54,000, you know, not, you know, less than a million, 
uh, utilities that that they overcome their barriers and their resistance to digital technology that can be their friend and lower their cost and help protect their staff. And and so I think just like what George said that that innovation due to the financial constraints is going to force them to think outside of the box. And and these technologies they're not bleeding edge. Uh, they're out of the box. They're they're available. They're they're true and tested. It's not. They, they don't need a pilot program, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, it's right there. And I, I think we really need to seize upon that. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, all right. Well, uh, before we wrap up, uh, George and Andy, I was wondering if you could uh, give us a bit of an overview on Moonshot Missions and, uh, you know, a little bit about, you know, what your goals are with the organization, what you're, you know, what you guys are working on. Um, thank you, Andrew, and uh, thank you again, Greg and Andrew, uh, for having us on uh, today. Um, Andy and I are very grateful, uh, in part because of the message we have. Both of us left well-established utilities um, to be part of Moonshot Missions, which is a nonprofit, and our goal is to help identify, customize, and implement exactly what we've been describing. And the interesting uh, issue for us is we were working on this before the coronavirus came. All the issues that the coronavirus and COVID-19 have, have accentuated were already here. We already had resiliency issues. We already had a silver tsunami. We already have had affordability challenges and equity issues. And the solutions were there. And what we've been struggling and building is a system to help those non-network utilities quickly assess, identify, and implement existing. We call them modules because we are sort of, they exist. We, we don't sell anything. We don't build them ourselves. We're just a delivery agent to help a utility um, assess, customize, and identify with peers who can help on the guidance of, of how to put these in place. And if we help a utility with one idea and get them on the path, it's our experience that once a utility realizes what's possible and their operating teams get a little flexibility in their budget and they didn't have to go for a rate increase, they got it on their own. What's the next one? Or let's do this one. How about that one? That's what happened at DC Water. Once the once we started going, we couldn't stop it. It was great, but we had to get on the path. And Moonshot is a nonprofit uh, with with the hopes of, of helping many utilities get on the path. You can visit us at moonshotmissions.org. It's in that link is in your article. We're very grateful for your for your publishing the article, and it's really meant uh, to uh, put some ideas forward. And I give Andy a lot of credit for many of the for coming up with these great ideas. And the example coming from Camden uh, County, what we did in at DC Water, and we're ready to serve. We're ready to help a utility in need. And for for underserved communities, we're able to do that at no cost. That's the advantage of being a nonprofit. So we're cheap on that respect, and we're ready to help. <laughs> yes, I agree with George. I mean, I, I think the underlying uh, principle of moonshot is that every single person deserves the right to have safe drinking water and clean waterways no matter where they live no matter where their zip code and so we're hoping to take the, these already known and proven technologies and practices and bring them to every community in the country so that everyone benefits from the knowledge that is already out there yeah absolutely well uh gentlemen uh been great talking to you. I think we could probably uh, we could we could probably talk about this stuff all day, but uh, I won't take up any more of your time. But um, thanks uh, thanks to all three of you for for joining me and uh, and uh, it's uh, great stuff. So um, so thanks again. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Greg, Thank having you. us Thank and you. Andrew. It's been a while, but it's great to talk to you again. Yep. Okay. Bye, -bye all right. everyone. Thanks.